Hi, I'm Julie Levitt Learson, and welcome to my lecture on Gothic fashion. So we're moving past that Romanesque era, and the Gothic era, many people refer to it as the High Middle Ages. Europe is kind of emerging from survival mode and developing closer connections with the wider world. Um, and that is resulting in a change in silhouette. And you can see um, from this um, carving from Chartres Cathedral and these statues that this silhouette of the 12th and early 13th century is vertical and slender. Um, the garments appear to be pleated or so finely woven that it just drapes very elegantly. So it's this vertical style that really helps to distinguish Gothic from Romanesque in terms of fashion. Um, and if there is one garment that really kind of stands out as the hallmark of 12th century Gothic fashion, you could think of the Blyatt. This is a woman's overgarment, so it's an overdress that has really close fitting bodice and long full skirts and sleeves that are narrow to the elbow and then they flare dramatically to the wrist. And the whole thing gets belted with a decorative girdle. So it's that same Romanesque tunic shape worn over a chemise and a really snug fitting kirtle, but that over tunic has gotten some refinement and a, and a new, um, new touches. Other things to look for, the men's tunics are also becoming slimmer. And for both men and women, this is helping with side lacing or sometimes back lacing. The men's tunics also have some fuller skirts and they've got some sleeve variations. Um, and men are switching from the kind of bulky um, breeches, like what I showed you in the Romanesque slideshow, into a more slender hose. Women's hair changes quite a bit in this era. and so do men. Sometimes their hair is short and clean shaven. At other times their hair is shoulder length and they have beards and mustaches. A lot of that is going to be dependent upon what the king at the time wants to do with his hair. And so here are two images of that Blyatt. On the left hand side, this is a detail from the Santa Elena Milano Basilica of San Lorenzo, Italy. And on the right is a 21st century um, reproduction. So you can see, right, that fitted bodice that's sort of hugging closer to the torso than flaring out below the hips, the sleeve that is clinging to the upper arm and then flaring out below the elbow. So this has more fabric than the tunics and overdresses that we were seeing in the Romanesque period. But as you can see here from this pattern, a very clever cutter can cut her rectangles of fabric in such a way to get these circular shapes without wasting her fabric. You can see those triangles become the bottoms of the sleeve or they become the gores in the shirt, skirt. But we are using quite a bit more fabric than we were in the earlier period. And this style, especially with these wide sleeves, gets taken to such an extreme that at one point they start to tie knots in their sleeves. I'm supposing just to keep them under a little bit more control. You can see here's a detail from a French illuminated manuscript called The Foolish Virgin, the late 1100s, and she's got the knots in her sleeves, and then on the right is a modern reproduction. But as you can see here, even with all of that extra fabric, the effect is still a long, lean, vertical silhouette. These are drawings from carvings at the Chartres Cathedral. And so you can see the women in their blyets, um, and you can see um, the way they're holding their arms, the, the wide sleeves become vertical. And then their long braids, their hair is parted in the center, and then it's in braids down over either shoulder. Um, and then they're wearing their mantles kind of draped over their shoulders to fall down to their sides. And even that is sort of re-emphasizing that long, lean, vertical line. And then their girdles have those long tails that hang down almost to their ankles. Which is not to say there wasn't variety in the fashion. Here's an image. It's a detail from the Hardenberg Cotex from about 1154. And you can see here um, variations on that vertical style. These women have their hair up, coiled um, around their head. They've got those uh, wide sleeves that are um, dripping from the elbow. You can see their blyette is cut short, so you can see their kirtle underneath that's in a contrasting color. And then they've slit the blyette in several places um, 
and have gores with contrasting fabric. But you can see here from these two images, one is from an illuminated manuscript from the 12th century from France, and on the right is a detail from an Italian fresco called the Foolish Virgins from the same time. It's a very body conscious look. The fabric is skimming closer to the body, and we've got a little bit more openness around the neckline. You can see they've got a very deep V um, on the front of the um, left hand image and the, that V is kind of held in place with what looks like a brooch. And one of the secrets to achieving this body conscious snug fitting look is to use something called side lacing. You can see that here in this detail on the left, which is a French uh, manuscript from the Lourdes de la Carum, and on the right, modern reproduction. But so what they would do is they would cut this blyette a little bit small. Um, and then they would leave the seams on the side between the underarm and the waist open, and they would punch little eyelets on either side and then lace it like a sneaker so that you can really control how tightly that fabric is going to get towards the body. And this makes a very form-fitting bodice. And then if it pulls tight, you're gonna get that kind of horizontal pleating that you can see from the lady on the left. And I guess one advantage to this is that you can kind of let out your clothes or take in your clothes a little bit as needed if your body changes shape a little bit. And of course, not everyone is going to be on trend. This is a detail from the Edewine Psalter from about 1160 CE. And you can see these women are um, kind of sticking towards that uh, older um, fashion silhouette that, that's a little bit more boxy. And you can see their oval mantles are kind of worn like ponchos. They're draped almost to their knees over their kirtles. But then we've got that one lady sitting on the left that appears to be maybe a little bit more body conscious. I've been focusing on women's fashion for the 12th century because men's fashion stayed pretty much the same as we discussed in the Romanesque period, but you will see some changes coming up. So moving into the 13th century or the 1200s, that clothing silhouette remains long and lean, but the sleeves are narrowing back down and becoming much more practical. So some key garments to look for is the tabard or the surcoat. This becomes a men's sleeveless tunic over an under tunic and over that chemise. And this surcoat or tabard is gonna have a scooped neck and open sides. It's not gonna be sewn down the side, but it is gonna be belted at the hip. And this is something that was uh, a military garment usually worn over armor. For women, um, their side, the surcoat is called a cyclus, um, which is kind of the feminine version of the tabard. It's a full length sleeveless gown, which is worn over a, a kirtle and it's slit from the armpit to the hip. Another garment to look for is something called a gardecore, which is going to be a heavy woolen calf length coat with very full flared sleeves and a hood attached. That's so going to be largely men that wear that. And another thing to look for is heraldry, which is these colors and symbols that are used in clothing to identify knights in the field. If you want to think of these as sort of like sports team uniforms so that you can identify who is who on the field of a football game or a baseball game. Same thing happens with knights in tournaments and in battle. And so we have lots of two-toned or three-toned color patterns and some symbols of animals or stylized stripes and other kinds of big, bold patterns that are easy to read from a distance. So here's an example from about 1240. This is a detail from the Macy Jawowski Bible. We've got men and a couple women here in this image. And you can see it's a simple, it's a more spare silhouette, kind of less outrageousness, less embellishment, certainly less embellishment than we saw in the Romanesque period with all of that embroidery around the neck edge. But you can see, right, the long tunics and then um, the kind of tabardy garments over in this figure in the center. So here are a couple of men in the Garda court and you can see um, those kind of hanging um, sleeves at the sides and then the, the slit um, open under the armpit that allows for freedom of movement. And here are some women in cycluses, uh, detail from a French manuscript on the left and from the Manas Codex on the right. The one on the right is a little bit later, about 1310. Um, the one on the left is about 1290. And here are some 
modern day interpretations of these garments. You can see the man in the garticor on the left, and you can see the woman in the cyclus on the right, and then we've got those kirtles and over tunics in the middle. Here are some examples of women's head coverings from this period. So those braids have been coiled up around the ears and around the back of the head. And now instead of letting that hair fall down over the shoulders, we were covering it up. So we could have this thing called a barbette, which is a, which is a linen, sometimes maybe silk if you're wealthy, um, draped rectangle that gets pinned to the hair and drapes under your chin and over your shoulders. And to that, you could add a wimple, which is another rectangular oval of cloth that drapes over the top of the crown of the head, and it would be pinned to that barbette. Or another thing a woman could do uh, with her barbette is she could pair it with this kind of round pillbox fabric-colored hat uh, called a toque. So here is our sleeveless surcoat, right? If we're not gonna do a tabard, that rectangle that just hangs straight down and belts, you might add some gores and stitch them all together and now you have a sleeveless surcoat. So taking the sleeves off of the um, surcoat from the previous period, keeping that slit in the center, knee length for knights who are uh, wearing it over their armor in the field, um, it could be a little bit longer and without that slit if you were a civilian like our uh, violinist here on the right. And here are some more images of those uh, sleeveless surcoats over armor. And you can see some of that heraldry I'm talking about. Um, the, the knights on the left have the lions of England or the red cross on the white ground that signifies a knight of the Templar. Um, and there will be lots of other combinations as well. And here is another image of Edward the Black Prince and his father, both wearing um, uh, sleeveless surcoats over armor that are showing the heraldic symbols of English royalty in the, 16, uh, in the 1360s. And as you can see, so it's not only acting as a kind of identifier um, over armor, but you can see it's also um, kind of changing the shape of the body. Of course, they're wearing armor, which changes the shape, but this, there's kind of a lot of padding in there, um, accentuating a broad chest. And here we have an example of that kind of tabard garment. The figure there on the left with the castles, and I think those are lions, um, on the fabric of his garment, that's that tabard, again, over armor. This is a painting depicting King Alfonso XI, King of Leon and Castile, about 1313. And I don't know if you've been noticing, but in these past few slides where I've been showing you armor, you haven't seen a lot of chain mail. Um, instead, we have been seeing armor that is called plate armor, where it's you know solid pieces of steel or iron um, instead of those mesh links kind of um, almost knitted together. And that is because um, weaponry is getting better at cutting through those mesh rings. And so, um, you know, steel plates seem to be doing the job for now. And this was a period where there was a lot of warfare um, as nations are trying to sort of sort themselves out and what territory belongs to whose. And also a time where a lot of Leisure time for the military classes were spent in armed comp competition like jousts and melees and things like that. So it's a very kind of rah-rah militaristic macho um, kind of sensibility. And so all of this military style kind of trickles down into the civilian fashion. So you can see these people here, they've got kind of those two color, three color patterns going on. They've got those bold stripes. They have um, some very simple patterns um, and some images um, on their clothing that is starting to resemble those um, military circuits with the heraldic imagery. This is a detail from a Verona fresco from the 14th century. Another big hallmark of fashion for the 14th century is this garment called the cotardy. This is something worn by both men and women, and it's a tight-fitting, long-waisted garment. Um, for men, it's going to fall somewhere between the hip and the knee, 
and it's going to have a kind of wide neckline, fitted sleeves, and there's going to button from the neck to the hem down the center front. For the women, the coat hardy, it's going to follow the same shape as the men's garment to the hips, but then it's going to fall to the ankle or to the floor in those full skirts that we have come to recognize. And they will have buttons as well. And so buttons have been used in India and China for the last 4,000 years. They don't really come to Europe until the 1100s, which is after King Richard I of England kind of noticed them while he was in the Middle East during the Third Crusade. And because he's king and he's popular um, and he likes the fashion, it becomes a fashion for everybody else. So here's where this garment, the coat hardy, comes from. This is a quilted coat hardy, or another word for it is called a poor points. And this is um, padding that was worn underneath armor. So you can see those wide shaped armholes that are going to really allow kind of maximum um, flexibility for arm movement, which is great when you have to swing a sword and hold a shield. And then it's tailored very close to the body, which also makes sense. You don't want a lot of bulk when you are in the middle of fighting a pitched battle. So, and there are all the buttons. You can see those sleeves are very tight fitting. And so the buttons allow that to happen because you can close the sleeve up once the arm is in it, then instead of struggling to get your arm through it. Um, and while it is quilted, meaning there's, you know, three layers kind of sandwiched together with some padding, and that's going to make the armor rest easier on the body, it's still quite form fitting. So this started out as kind of like an undergarment for military wear, and then became an outer, you know, for show garment for civilian dress. So you can see here are three grave effigies of men. They're all wearing coat hardies. These are all from the 14th century, but you can see there's some variation here. But what they do have in common is, you know, snugly fitting to the body, buttons down the center front, some tight sleeves, um, and they range anywhere between the hip and the knee. You'll also notice here that their men's hair is a bit longer than in previous um, images, and they have beards. You can see also they're wearing more tightly fitting hose um, and they've got belts with pouches on them and you know places to hold their daggers and swords. So here's a pattern of how to make a coat hardy, the front and the back, they're shaped a little bit different. And as you can see, they're really cut to be wide at the shoulders and the armpit and then snug through the rib cage and the waist and then flaring out just a little bit again at the hips. And then that sleeve is tight fitting as well. And this is a really snug fit that shows off a trim athletic figure. And here is the female version of the coat hardy. Left is a statue from Christchurch in Oxford, England from about 1350. On the right is a modern day reproduction. But there you can see it, right? So it looks like a man's garment until you reach the hip line and then it flares out. And again, gores and gussets are gonna help us with a successful fit here, but also we're gonna curve those seams so that it can really get close to the body. So we're moving away from rectangles and we're starting to curve. But as you can see here from these shapes, um, you can't just take a rectangle of fabric and use all of the fabric in that rectangle to make a dress. You're gonna have leftover scraps. So maybe one thing you could do with those scraps is to make tippets. Tippets are these long, narrow streamers of fabric that are attached to the sleeves. And you can see men and women wore them. Um, and as you can see with our lady here on the left, you know, it almost looks like she's wearing two gowns, right? Like she had a green gown and a red gown and she spliced them together. So you're going to see that with lots of garments here on both men and women, this kind of mix matching of color. This is that rollover from um, heraldry. Um, and so your tippets might contrast your main garment, or they might be of the same fabric. But perhaps this is one way to make use of that kind of leftover scrap. Another thing that was kind of popular in this era is a technique called dagging. You can see it here on the blue hood and on the white tippets on these two men, that it's just decorated shaped edges on the sleeves and hems. So instead of cutting it straight across or letting the edge be the finished selvage edge from your loom. People are cutting it into triangles or teardrop shapes or loops or scallops or kind of leafy things. 
Here is a detail from the Romance of Alexandre from 1340. You can see men and women both in code hardies. And as you can see, um, this is a rather youthful silhouette that's kind of emphasizing an hourglass shape, you know, broad shoulders or bountiful chest, um, strong hips and a thin, narrow waist. Here's a detail from Vows of the Peacock from about 1345, 1350. Um, you can see here women's necklines are lower. We can see their collarbones. We can see a lot of their shoulder and neckline. And then the men's hoods are covering their necks and shoulders, but it, that's kind of giving this sense of broad shoulders. So we're kind of sexualizing the genders a little bit here. And as you can see, we're still dressing in layers. Um, the layers are body conscious, but we've still got, you know, our three layers going on. And you can see with the women's gown in particular, you can start to see through the different layers. And you can see the lady in blue on the right. It looks like she's got pockets on the outside layer of hers. Let's take a closer look at some of these hoods. Um, these are reproductions again. Um, the one on the right might be older, but I can't, I don't have the source on that anymore. Anyway. Um, this hood is actually kind of like a combination of a hat and a cape that drapes over the shoulders. So it's like two half circles and then this hood shape. Um, and you can see sometimes some buttons um, down the front. Um, and um, it has kind of multiple uses. Then we have a streamer like the tippet. But if your hood has a streamer off the end of it, that's called a lira peep. Here's another image of a reproduction of the chaperone. And as you can see, it can be a versatile garment, right? It, it can be worn as a hood, or if you want to roll the ends of your hood up, you can turn it into a floppy hat, and then your Lyra pipe streamer just becomes like a jaunty scarf. And you can see here, um, there's that dagging again on the edges. And here are some more women. This is from an Italian breviary from about 1380. That Code Hardy shape again, again, very pretty, very feminine. You can see that exposed neckline. Um, their hair is coiled up around their faces and sometimes kind of worked into a padded roll. I guess all the better to see that neckline, right? But the fabrics are very pretty and you can see, um, you know, there's more um, detail in the fabrics. We've been seeing a lot of solid colored fabrics for quite a while and now we're starting to see some pattern and brocading in there again. Here are some details of the hairstyles, right? Coiled up in braids and, and looped over the ears or wound around the head um, at about the ear and eye line. Or if we want to be really fancy, we can cover our coiled braids up in this net and hold it in place with a headband or a fillet. And um, it's called a call. The lady on the right would be wearing a call or the lady on the figure on the left, it's called a crispin or crispinette, where it kind of becomes this solid headdress. But you can see um, what the impetus is. Hold those braids in place with a net, and then you kind of, that net gradually becomes a fabric covered thing um, that's more like a headdress that conceals the hair entirely. And as you can see, you can go as fancy as you like, if you've got the money. So there seems to be a little bit more um, conspicuous consumption of fabric here because as I said, this silhouette that's more body conscious requires you wasting some fabric, right? But it also requires you to be a more skilled stitcher to put these things together. You're not just draping a rectangle around your body and pinning it, right? Um, and this body conscious silhouette, um, because it's tighter around the midsection, a well-cut snugly fit gown will support a woman's bosom. Um, and so oftentimes the under kirtle is going to be quite tight to do this work and the over kirtle or surcoat might be a little bit roomier. Um, lacing is going to do this and sometimes they would have a stiffened panel in there too. But there's one more innovation that's kind of a recent discovery I want to share with you. Okay, the center images here, they're called the Lengberg bra and braids. These were um, items, there were four of these kind of bra-like structures and that one pair of braids, and they were discovered under floorboards of an Austrian castle of Langeberg. And um, they were discovered in like 2008 when they were doing renovation. 
These items were made of linen. They were obviously used and worn, and then for some reason discarded under these floorboards. Um, and they're from the early 15th century, so the 1400s. And what we think, I mean, if you look at them on the left and right of this image, you can see modern reproductions where people are trying to guess what was this garment would look like in its entirety. And it looks not unlike kind of a contemporary, you know, long line bra, right? Um, the German word for this, you, we have seen this description pop up in, in, in uh, manuscripts um, before, but we hadn't seen actual garments because they weren't illustrated in the manuscripts or in church paintings or frescoes, which makes a certain amount of sense, right? The German word for this is Tutensack, which translates roughly into breast bags, which is not at all an uh, elegant description, but uh, I guess it's to the point, right? So it's basically a short shirt with pouches made to fit the breasts into. Um, but as you can see, that's going to do a, a pretty decent job of supporting a, a woman's breasts. Now, the braids, as you can see, they look just like the men's braids that we were looking at earlier, just a little bit slimmer fit. They don't have that big roll. They've got that, that um, kind of cord around the top of it. Um, and so when these were discovered, everyone was like, oh, well, these have got to be a man's braids because it has always, not always, it has been assumed for quite some time that women didn't wear any undergarment around their lower extremities. And um, I don't know why scholars just assume this, I guess, because they didn't see evidence of it in the historical record. But here's the thing. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And there are certain periods in a woman's life where it would be quite beneficial for her to wear something around her hips um, and in between her legs. And so having these braids discovered with these kind of medieval bras, for me anyway, lends credence to the idea that women wore braids just like men. It was just for whatever cultural reason they didn't depict women in their undies in paintings, right? And think of it, like a woman wearing pants or might be considered a symbol of male power. And so to see a woman in pants, even if it's underpants, might be some sort of threat to that male power. Um, anytime there would be a depiction of a woman in art wearing pants or underpants, it was usually satirical or fantastical. Like, you know, look who's wearing pants. It's this woman who's just crazy, out of control. Um, but here we have it. Moving on from underwear, let's talk a little bit about footwear. Here are some examples of some kind of low boots and shoes. They're leather, they tend to be quite soft. They're gonna lace up, they're form fitting to the foot. Um, and then there's stockings right there with a leather sole underneath. So it's like a shoe sock or a slipper sock. Here's a very fashionable form of footwear from the 1300s called a poulain and you can see this is this is a, a period piece that is in a museum but you can see it's a leather slipper it would have laced there um at the instep and but it's longer than the natural foot right it, it lengthens the human foot to this kind of exaggerated proportion and it has a pointed toe this was a very very popular fashion for a while one theory about how they came to be is that there was a guy um a, a nobleman who had kind of a bunion. And so he just elongated his shoes to hide that figure flaw. And then it became popular. Um, but again, it's more leather than you need to make a shoe. And like most fashion trends, this one could get out of hand. Um, sometimes the, the toe would extend much further than this and it would curl up, right? So like elf shoes, this is where the inspiration for elf shoes come from and sometimes they would curl up so exaggeratedly that they would need like a cord or a ribbon to tie the toe around the calf so to hold that curved up shape in place they had like scaffolding tied around the leg if you can imagine how awkward that might be walking around but you know fashion what are you going to do now here is a very practical maybe not fashionable piece of footwear. These are called chopines and they're overshoes. They're wood. They might have a platform on them and you would slide your 
feet in their leather shoes into these Chopines and it's going to raise you up a couple inches off the ground and it's going to keep your shoes and your feet and maybe the hem of your garment out of the mud. And here's another little weird fashion trend from the time. Stirrupose. I come from the 80s. This, these leggings with stirrups were big in the 80s, but it looks like we didn't invent them. They go all the way back to the 1300s. Okay, one more period to get through today. Late Gothic, so we're in the early 1400s. And women's sideless surcoats um, take on a very exaggerated form here. The French term for this is fenêtre d'enfer, the windows into hell or the gates of hell, um, because the surcoat doesn't have sleeves, but it has these super deeply cut armholes so that you can see when a woman stands sideways, you can see her tight fitting kirtle underneath, which means you can see her body. Um, so one could be tempted to hell by seeing a woman's body even through these layers of fabric. Another big trend was something called a hoopaland, which is a really long, loose robe worn by both men and women. And it tended to be a little bit more fitted around the bodice, but had big old flaring sleeves again and a really full skirt. And these would be belted. Um, they might have a high collar, they might have fur trim, they might have slit side seams, they might have daggy, they might have all of the above. But again, it's a big volume over gown again. And then in women's headwear, um, this thing called a henin, which is a tall cone-shaped headdress with lots of varieties to it. So here is that sideless surcoat I was telling you about. And you can think of this as kind of like the evolution of the cyclists from the last century. And these three images, one is from um, Les Belles de Le Duc de Berry from 1408. One in the middle is from the Specularum Historial from 1463. And right is from a manuscript of Tristan de Lenoy from 1406. Okay, so different different places, different um, slightly different times, but same trend. And you can see it can get quite silly. There's there's a whole lot exposed. You can see they can be trimmed with fur um, on the inside, and then they're showing you this very very tightly fitted kirtle underneath. On the right hand side of the image, you can see this was a side the surcoat from. Uh, Leonor de Castile from the 1400s. And as you can see, this is a very rich silk and cloth of gold garment. It was well loved and well used. You can see it's been patched. And then you can contrast that side, the surcoat with the hoopaland. So you can see we've got two versions of it right here, man and a woman. He's got contrast on his sleeves. She's got um, a lining that's a contrasting color so that when her sleeve is turned back, you can see it. Um, They've got high necks, looks like they're trimmed with fur. Um, she's got a really wide belt that's well above her natural waist. Um, and his belt is a little high, but it's it's uh, more close to the natural waist. And then you can see they've got kind of like these soft folds, not quite pleats, but like rounded pleats maybe um, to hold all that fullness in place so that you still get this quasi body conscious silhouette. More men in hoopalans, you can see, um, the length is going to vary quite a bit from just kind of below the bum to the knee to the ankle. Um, sleeves have a variety. You know, they can be super wide, they can be dagged, or they can be a little bit more practical. And they're all paired with um, hose. And then you can see some of those, um, the poulain um, on the image on the left as well. And so here is a period um, from the early, uh, from the mid 1400s. This is a Burgundian nobleman's funeral clothes that ended up uh, donated to a museum. But here's a hoopland from the period. And as you can see, right, those, those kind of soft rounded pleats that I was telling you about. Um, and so these would have been kind of formed and then stitched in place to, to help them hold their shape. Here's another variation on the sleeves. These are called bagpipe sleeves because they're super wide between the bicep and the elbow, and then they narrow right down at the forearm and kind of make a, a big hanging bag. So they're not those open hanging sleeves um, from earlier in the period, but they're caught up again by the time we reach the wrist. 
some more men and women in Hoopalands. This is from about 1440, 1450. This is in the Netherlands. Um, again, you can see the variety, um, the slits, the lengths, the sleeve shape. Um, but you can also see kind of the luxurious fabrics. We've got more of that patterning, especially in the women's garments. Um, and you can see um, that women's necklines are a little bit different from the men's, right? They're turned back at the center front to show off that contrasting lining. And then they kind of like fold back down over the shoulders, almost like a modern um, blazer collar. And then you can see that low square neckline of the tighter kirtle underneath. You can also see on their heads, right, on the women's heads, those padded rolls that we were showing you earlier have gotten bigger and a little bit more outrageous. And you can see the men have the um, the chaperone kind of rolled up into the hat. So it's kind of um, repeating the women's padded roll shape there as well. More men and women in hoopalads, hoopalands and um, kind of silly hats. But you can see, again, these can be quite luxurious, right? We're getting beyond just the wool and linen. We're into some silk fabrics for the wealthy, if you can manage it. Um, and this all comes from all that trading that came about after um, the disastrous military exploits of the Crusades. Um, the silver lining of all of that mayhem was opening up of trade routes, which means re- connecting with merchants from the Silk Road that are bringing silk textiles all the way from China across the Mideast where it might be woven into these amazing brocades and then brought to Europe. And here are some 21st century reproductions of women's hoopalans. Okay, so here you can see kind of all of the trends at once. We've got the sideless surcoat, we've got the hoopalans, and we've got henins. Hennins are these cone-shaped hats. This is a detail from a painting called Philosophy, presenting the Severn liberal arts to Bo Boethius, about 1470. So you can see, right, the, the kind of standard fairy tale princess cone headdress. It looks like they're wearing an ice cream tone, cone on top of their heads. But um, there are some other varieties of hennins as well. So um, take a look at these, and then we'll go into detail in the next few slides. If instead of making that ice cream cone uh, princess headdress, you just kind of like cut the cone off about the third away up from the base, you have something called a truncated henin. So here's a detail from a painting, and then we have a modern reproduction of it. So it's it's almost like a fez shape, right? Um, and they're trimmed, and then they're veiled. Um, it looks like the lady on the right in this painting probably has a little um, coif. Um, underneath this cap, and our modern um, lady in the reproduction clothing has skipped that detail. A more outrageous version of this henin is something called the heart-shaped henin, and as you can see here on the left, this is a modern reproduction, but it's, um, you take that henin, and instead of a cone, you make it more the shape of a heart on top of the head, and then you cover it with a big old padded roll, and you get something that looks like this. On the right-hand side are templates, right? If you remember that um, the, the call, um, the net call that was holding those coiled braids and then it kind of became a headdress, here is a more extreme version of it. And these could get quite outrageous. They kind of look like cow horns sometimes. Here's another variation on the henin. This is called a butterfly henin because you can see the veil is draped uh, um, kind of up in the stratosphere above the head and away from the body of the hat. Um, and it's it's done by these wires or reeds that are attached to the top of the henin, and then they stick straight up in the air and then come forward kind of like um, antenna on a butterfly. And then you um, drape the veiling, which is going to be a very lightweight material so it doesn't collapse, right, on top of it. And the last image I want to leave you with for this era is, um, a, is from this Jan van Eyck painting from 1434 called the Arnolfini Wedding. It's depicting a couple um, who were of the wealthy merchant class. So they weren't kings or queens or aristocrats, but they were, you know, middle class people that had made a lot of money. And they are dressed in all of their finery. They are showing off their wealth and prosperity here in this painting. So you can see the 
man here. He's got an outrageously kind of sugarloaf shaped hat, but he's got a plum, um, which would have been expensive, uh, a tabard that's trimmed in fur, and he's wearing that over a black coat hardy, and he's got his hose and his shoes, and you can see his chopines there over on the side. And then the lady is wearing a blue tight-fitting kirtle and then a very sumptuous um, hoopland over in this green with this really kind of complicated dagging there on the sleeve and, you know, crazy wide sleeves. And it is trimmed in that kind of white fur. She's got the kind of cow horn um, coiled braids with a lace veil over top. And lots of people, I'm sure you've seen this painting before, you know, lots of people look at how she's holding that fabric up and are like, oh, she must be pregnant. Well, maybe she is, but let me show you a modern reproduction. Here it is. This was made, oh, I think maybe three or four years ago, 2017. Um, and it was done for a television show um, put out by the BBC called A Stitch in Time, where they looked at kind of iconic garments from the centuries and tried to recreate them with as closely as they could the existing materials, the existing tools, and the existing methods. So they dyed this fabric um, and sewed it by hand um, and did all these things to kind of make it almost exactly as, as it would have been then. And then they dressed the host in the dress. And when she put this dress on, she said, oh my God, it is so heavy. Um, and there's just so much of it. And these sleeves are so heavy and there's so much skirt and oh my God. Um, and she said that it was more comfortable for her to lean back to kind of allow her to accommodate the weight of the gown. And then when she lifted the skirts up, kind of held it in front of her, the way the, the lady in the Arnolfini wedding, um, painting is posed, you know, there's so much bulk in that fabric that kind of gives her this illusion of pregnancy. Um, and it also in the portrait, um, kind of shows off a little bit more of that silk kirtle underneath. So this is where I want to leave you right now. We kind of went from long and lean silhouette to a more narrow tapered silhouette. And now we're back to kind of like full and big and sumptuous silhouette again. <laughs>